What's up, Come Up family? My name is Mark, and this is Language Come Up, a place where I come up, and you do too. So I never thought I'd be one of those stereotypical guys, stereotypical guys and say, today we have a guest that needs no introduction, but you know what, in this case, it's kind of true. So here we have Benny Lewis with us. How you doing, Benny? I'm doing great. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time. I've got a bunch of things I want to get into, and um, you know, my first question, we're going to start right off the bat is you've been someone that has been in this community of language learning for a long time. You were one of the first person people to appear and start to get some kind of traction. So as years have gone on now, I think your influence has shown from your travel vlogs to your challenges, to your website, to your books. I think you have done so much for language learning to have helped, you have helped so many people in terms of getting interested in languages learning languages, and I've talked to people who've become pro pro prolific polyglo polyglots in their own rights, and they've credited you with getting interested in languages. Do you sometimes reflect on the influence for the good and the positive that you've had after all these years since you've got into this venue? Yeah, I mean, it's very humbling that I, I do get people who reach out to me, maybe send me an email, or maybe I bump into them at, the event, at an event. And they say that something that I wrote uh, years ago has inspired them. And uh, I've met people who have overtaken me in languages and language skills who would have initially come across me as a monoglot. And it just boggles the mind that, uh, you know, from my perspective, I just uh, like cre created a URL for my blog and then just punched the keyboard for a while. And um, that, made a difference in the world so it's uh it's definitely an honor and i i hope i can continue to try to inspire people to get into their language learning it absolutely did and it's just the beautiful thing of how one thing can come from just a simple idea you know you wanted to learn a language and you start sharing your progress and look what's come of it you know i think it's quite amazing yeah and like ultimately i I did want to, like, I, I was a newcomer to the uh, language learning space. Like, I started creating content online in 2006, and it was way more in the travel space. Uh -huh. And so it's been interesting for me to get into the language learning space because I, I didn't really interact with other polyglots mm. when, um, for the vast majority of my travels until I found the polyglot community and I would go to polyglot events. And like, I come from a very different need of how I use my languages and that's influenced how I write about them and how I encourage people to, to try to get into speaking them. Um, and, you know, I see, like, it's, it's had some conflicts with some language learners, but ultimately, uh, like, when we get down to it and actually talk to one, one another and see what language learning is truly about for us, I found way more overlap than, uh, than differences with uh, no matter what language learner I'll come across. Absolutely. Everyone can have their own way, but, I mean, the way that I see it and what really comes through it, in your teachings and your perspective is that it's really just about human connection, connecting with people. I think this is the key essence of what this is all about. Language is communication and some people go about it in different ways. You like to go about it from the beginning. I think that's wonderful because you're using it what it's really there for. Yeah, I mean the uh, speak from day one philosophy that's been the theme of my entire language learning process. It's been to battle perfectionism, because I know a lot of people give in to this concept that I cannot use the language until I feel ready. And I, I guess because I have a background in engineering, mm -hmm. uh, engineering kind of distinguishes itself from something like science, because science exists in, in some ways in a, in a very ideal theoretical world, uh, whereas engineering takes into account that, like, you know, there's going to be friction in this system and uh, there's going to be wind that slows you down and that the real world is never perfect, that there's always some loss of energy or something like that. And that's how I've got into languages is thinking that this is never going to be a perfect system. 
-hmm. and and if I ex accept that and embrace it, I can find something that does as well as it can possibly do for me and repair it as I go and improve upon it from there. And uh, I've really tried to emphasize this every time I talk about language learning. Absolutely. And before we get into some of the, the details of language learning and the whole process, which I mentioned, very interested to get into, I really want to ask you this. Um, not so many people in the language sphere have done things such as giving TED Talks, you know, like I'm a person that loves, for example, bands and music. I love to know about the things that happen, for example, around the recording process, what was going on during this time or during some concerts, what were there conflicts, were there some, what was going on in, in the band? So I wanna ask you, you've done two TED Talks, right? Yeah, yeah, so what's, what's interesting about the TED Talks is that it's a lot easier than people think it is to give a TED Talk and I, um, I think one thing I have going for me, I definitely never describe myself as someone smarter than others. I think, uh -huh. you, you know, other polyglots, I would immediately say so many of them are more intelligent than I am. Mm -hmm. But I, I am a very, uh, a very bold person. I do take a lot of risks and I do get myself out there. I'm an extrovert mm -hmm. and uh, I use that to my advantage. So with the TED Talk, I had actually never spoken on stage in my entire life. Are you serious? Yep. I the the best I ever did did was to speak in front of a classroom, but mm. I'd never actually spoken on stage, and I my blog is at the the level that you know I had I had interacted with other uh, pretty well known bloggers. They had given TED talks, and I was thinking you know uh, maybe I should do this. Mm -hmm. And instead of like if you imagine applying to give a TED talk, you imagine sending in an application and saying. I am the best speaker you can imagine because of this reason, this reason, this reason. You would be crazy not to have me at your event. I, I took a different approach. Uh, each TED city tends to, or each TED like event tends to have its own particular theme to it. And the city has its own personality that wow. ties in somehow with the talk. And I, I did research for the upcoming talks and it turned out that San Antonio uh, has the highest population of Hispanic people in America that does not speak Spanish. Wow, I did not know that. A very specific criteria Interesting. There. So when I found that information, that's how I decided when I was sending my pitch, rather than saying, I'm Benny, do you have any idea who I am? I'm so amazing, <laughs> you should absolutely... No, I, I was like, hey guys, I... I know that in San Antonio, there's a lot of adults who may have uh, a background of having f Spanish speakers in their family and felt a lot of guilt at never being able to speak Spanish themselves. I grew up only monolingual and I got into language learning late in life. I'd like to share my story to encourage people to have a, a similar change to theirs. Mm -hmm. And that's all that they needed to hear. And then when it came down to actually giving the talk, another thing that surprises people is that I had absolutely nothing prepared. <laughs> so I, 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 I cannot do preparation. That, that oh, like, I, I, I'm generally a very easygoing guy, but the, yeah. the kind of things that stress me out are trying to remember specific things. So trying to remember a speech would stress me out, Dude. whereas winging it, is much more my vibe. <laughs> so I just got up on that stage, was thinking language learning, blah, 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 blah. Someone held up a sign, one minute left. So I was like, oh, wrap up, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, whatever I said, there's seven days in a week and some day is not one of them, go speak a language. You remember that, that one, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> threw that in and uh, it went viral. And like ultimately a lot of the stuff with the modern, age of social media and um it's very easy to if you're if you're trying to like people always imagine uh there's there's like a, an organized process behind it but it, it really is just throwing stuff at the wall and maybe something will stick and like i was making videos on youtube for for years and i never got any traction on that mm. whereas the blog just happened to hit a nerve that the blog really exploded and that TED talk just happened to be an interesting enough story that that also exploded itself. And that's the thing, like with people who, who imagine somebody with a large audience like I have, 
Um, they, they, they have this idea of the story being such like a natural progression, mm -hmm. but it really is, if you see, especially nowadays, even more so than before, the likes of TikTok that people can just like, if you just upload enough content, something eventually will probably go viral. Right. And that's, that's kind of how it really works. So um, in my story, I just like would share what I did in as many forms as I could and something eventually stuck. That's quite uh, inspiring, even even for me as a, a content creator in the language sphere. You know, I, I don't do many videos that could get, you know, go viral. Just, do, you know, I'm not doing Omegle videos. I'm not doing, um, you know, sur guy surprises uh, other people in, in the streets. Those are great, but um, actually, <laughs> it's yeah, kind of focused on what to. I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to. That's not your, per like, it's, that's not my personality. I am not, I am not the white guy speaks whatever. <laughs> That, that is just not going to work for me, but it works for other people. And yeah. they found that that is ideal for them and they have fun with it. And that's the thing is like, you, you have to see what do you actually jive with. Mm -hmm. And there's been many trends in both language learning and content creation mm -hmm. that I've been tempted to jump on, but it just wouldn't be me. And gotcha. Uh, as long as I've stuck to that, it means that I am satisfied now that even if, if I jumped on this trend earlier, maybe I'd have more subscribers or something, but I can be very happy in the kind of content that I, that I make because of the uh, more restricted view that I'll do it if I actually care about it. That's right. And I mean, I'm, I'm doing something that I'm really, really passionate about. And honestly, it just feels good even having a small audience. I know that that small audience is there for what I'm bringing to the table. And I find that quite nice. Everyone who's ever had any kind of following always started with a small audience. So the more you put into it, the more it'll grow and you'll, you'll see. Right. I really related to what you said about the whole San Antonio population of Hispanics there, but not speaking Spanish. I actually, I come from Ohio, but my dad was originally from Mexico. My mom is American and I grew up monolingual too, right? So um, the circumstances around why I came to Mexico were a bit unfortunate. My dad got sick, he passed away. And it was when this happened, I decided, you know what? I always had this idea that was lingering to go to Mexico to, to meet, to really get to know my Mexican side, to learn Spanish. But you know, you're in college and then you finish college and you have to go get the job and you get the job. But when this thing happened to my dad, you know, my world just kind of stopped. And I said, what am I going to do? You know, being there in the wake of this depressed, you know, down. Um, I said, I'm going to go to Mexico. And my uncle took me in. And on the first night that I'm there, he's like, you are going to teach English and you're going to go study Spanish. And I'm like, um, I'm like I know how to speak English, but teaching it is kind of, you know, out of my realm. But basically, this is how my story started, because it's through these two things that I was able to kind of pull myself out of what I was in and, and really to make life beautiful again, you know, to be able to give something that I have to offer, which is my native language to people like my dad who studied English in Mexico, that I can do my part to contribute. But at the same time, I'm learning Spanish in, in this new wonderful environments. And it was just like this combination that changed my life. I'm still an English teacher. And, you know, now I'm still learning languages. I'm, I'm still working on my Spanish trying to get that, you know, going and improving more it's at a pretty nice level but i've been focusing on russian but just the idea of you know this was 2014 when i got into this and um i when i found stuff online and i knew that this was just right for me and ever since then i've i've maintained that passion and in, in terms of giving and also taking in and so i really relate to that whole idea of having like the cultural aspect lingering there but never quite delving into it it's been something that you know really changed my life mm -hmm. absolutely and i know recently you you went to mexico and i've been following you your activities online and when you took that mexico trip was that the first trip that you had taken in a long time because i swear that i, hadn't, I didn't see you like off and about yeah i mean i i did make it to ireland briefly in august uh, but other than that, I, ha I hadn't been uh, outside of America for a whole year and a half. Mm -hmm. And uh, like in the last five or six years, any trips I've taken have generally been 
very brief. Uh, okay. So they, I, I would call any trip in the last like seven or eight years as mo as more of like a typical vacation rather uh, okay. than any kind of language immersion. Whereas Mexico was a change to that. Mexico really? was, yeah, yeah. Mexico was not go to a country for an event or go to a country to relax for a few days and then come straight back. Mm -hmm. Mexico was to break that trend. And wow. I was I was only there for a month, but it was still nice. it's a nice an, little chunk. It was a nice little chunk, and I uh, I made new friends, and I genuinely got to uh, practice my Mexican Spanish because Ooh. Mexican Spanish itself was new to me. Oh, nice. You know, uh, like I've done the C2 diploma in Spain, so I, I already have the high level of Spanish. Right. But I really wanted to dive into Mexican Spanish in particular, and uh, the uh, the fun I had in learning the expressions, the uh, particular vocabulary and mm. everything was was just amazing. And I got to explore different cities and I had people explaining the cultural significance of Day of the Dead to me. Ooh, yeah. um, so I, I had just the, the best time and that Mexico pushed me over the edge that I was wondering if, you know, because I, I went through a very, very difficult time when I was in New York, mm -hmm. had a very, uh, very bad string of luck in multiple aspects of my right. life. And I needed time to recover from that. And I was wondering, like, how much time do I need? But Mexico showed me that, like, even though mental health recovery is a process in and of itself, I feel like I'm at the stage now where I'm ready to get back into full-time travels. Wow. And Mexico reminded me of that. So that. That, that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to end this lease on my house and uh, at some stage in 2022, hit the road again. That's so cool. I find that from the foreigners that I talk to and that I see and that I've met here in Mexico, Mexico has like this, this charm to it where people come and sometimes they just never leave. <laughs> they never leave, you know? Take me, for instance. I keep on finding excuses to stay. So it's actually, it has something. But what I wanted to ask you is, you know, everyone knows a little something about Mexico, but what was something that, you know, you really even were taken aback by, maybe in a good way or maybe in a whatever kind of way, but what was your impression? What, what surprised you? What made you really think, so this is Mexico? I mean, I, I had heard the expression, uh, mi casa es tu casa, mm -hmm. like for years. <laughs> and um, like, I didn't think anything of it, but I really felt that that definitely belongs to, to Mexico. That, mm. that phrase in particular, it doesn't belong to Spanish. It belongs <laughs> to Mexico uh, because of the level of hospitality mm. that I got, even though I didn't know some people um, very well. The, like just the fact that I was showing an interest in getting to know their city or getting to know the Day of the Dead event and the history behind it, they went out of their way to make me feel welcome and to make me feel at home when I was with them. And like the amount of invitations I got to, you know, oh, you can stay at ha my house, you can come over here for dinner. And <laughs> it, was, um, it was really heartwarming because mm. in like, there are other countries where I have gotten that kind of reception, but it, the, the contrast has been a little bit stronger for me now, having lived in America uh, for as long as I have, where that's way less common. Mm. So, um, yeah, the hospitality definitely pushed me over the edge, and uh, I I really enjoyed it. And it was, uh, I say, the first of many uh, like true visits to Mexico that I'm planning. Wow! So you were in Mexico City, I think you were in Puebla too. Yeah, in uh, Cholula. Cholula. Oh, yeah. yeah, and then uh, also Veracruz. And uh, Veracruz, very nice. Okay, so you got a, you got around of it. Super cool, excellent. Yeah, it's a, one of those things that, that I know you've talked about. It's just how studying a language literally opens up a new world. I've always felt that it's like, you know, it's like a portal that you can just jump through. All of a sudden, you're really in a new world. And if you speak that language, then you're actually able to like communicate, play that game. You know, interact. For me, that's just like. A wonderful <laughs> a wonderful thing i think man you can you can actually do that again and again yeah yeah like in veracruz i went to somebody's birthday party and 
Uh, there were several people there. I think because maybe Veracruz doesn't necessarily get that much foreign tourism. Mm -hmm. There were several people there who had never met a non-Mexican in their entire life. Yep. I can and see that. <laughs> they, they were just fascinated to talk to me wow. and they were amazed by like everything I had to say because, you know, I've traveled the world and I've right. done some interesting things and the, their level of genuine interest was, uh, was just so lovely because I, uh, you know, like in, in a cynical world where, uh, you know, you got, you got to act cool and, and pretend like you don't care um, <laughs> to, to get that level of like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Uh, uh, just just reminds you that you should be appreciative of things you have in life, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's one thing that you can definitely notice in Mexico and in, in some areas that just the level of happiness and you think, wow, maybe these people really don't have that much. But look how happy they are. They're together. And you can find such beauty in that. Definitely. So to switch gears a little bit, going into the language learning realm again. So I want to talk about just some things that I know that you have mentioned, whether they're concepts of yours, whether they're just things that you've talked about, things that you are in favor of, and we just can kind of have, have like this dialogue back and forth. So I'm going to throw out some things and just tell me what comes to mind. All right. So feeling like an idiot, when speaking the language. Yeah, that's uh, that for me is a necessary part of the pro the process. It's um, like, but it comes back to perfectionism. Exactly. If you are so afraid of sounding like an idiot that you don't want to speak the language until you don't sound like an idiot, you will never speak the language. <laughs> and I, I could, uh, coming back to that whole engineering uh, mentality. I consider the world as imperfect. It is a chaotic system. And if you embrace that, you'll get so much more out of life. So languages are just, it's just necessary that you're going to suck at it. Of course. Once you embrace that and accept that your goal is not to sound like an eloquent speaker, your goal is to suck a little less every day. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I think of. Um, that making mistakes just reminds me that it's it's a part of the process. Absolutely, and you know you can even realize this in in later stages of of being advanced. For example, let's say my Spanish is is C one, which you know it is. So if you get me in conversation, you're going to be like, damn, the guy the guy speaks well. But you know I've noticed, for example, just being out and about. Sometimes you know if I need to say something really quick, or I have to say something like really spontaneous or in the moment, or something very specific, I'll see how I, I'll mess up, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me try this again. You know, this is even at like a supposed advanced level. So language learning is something that is always keeping you humble, is constantly humbling yourself. So it's just like, all right, I'm at this level now, and I even have some kind of embarrassing moments. You just got to learn to. Just just say whatever, <laughs> forget it, and just keep it moving, you know? So even at these advanced levels, when you, you think that when you're at lower levels, when I get to C1, C2, it's going to be just like so smooth. Even then, you have mistakes, so it's just like embrace it. That's life, whatever. <laughs> Enjoy life. Yeah, we're always going to be learning. So even at the C levels, the, the advantage of the C levels is your scope of conversations you can have is so much wider but you, you still have things to learn. So um, there's never going to be a point at, at, with any language where you can say, my work is done, I know everything. You know, nice. even, even as a native English speaker, there are moments when people in America will say a term and I'll be like, what the hell is that? I've never heard of that. <laughs> it, and that does not mean that I'm not worthy of the title of native English speaker. You know? uh -huh. Absolutely. You kind of segued into the next thing I wanted to comment on, which is perfectionism is terrible in language learning benny lewis what can you say about that yeah like the problem is that languages are tied in with academia mm -hmm. that for a lot of us that's been our experience with it that you learn a language similar to how you would learn history or geography where you have to absorb information so because of this languages get put on this pedestal where the goal is you need to know the maximum number of words and you need to be able to regurgitate 
the perfect grammatical constructs of these sentences. And if you do not do that, you are a failure. Mm -hmm. And that is that either or mentality that if you make a mistake in a language, then that is a big red X. And if you make enough mistakes, you've failed exactly like uh, a test. Whereas it's quite the opposite with languages. The more mistakes you make, the more you're practicing. And I always tell people, especially in the initial stages, my goal is I'm going to make at least 200 mistakes today. And that gets me out of my comfort zone. Um, Cause if, if you, if you get bogged down by perfectionism, you just never make any progress. It's just so essential to embrace the fact that this is an imperfect process. And uh, you'll only get, you'll only make progress if you're, if you're accepting that mistakes are just going to happen. Sure. And um, this is why I, I'm, I'm, I kind of like this, this whole idea of, you know, using the language, just using the language because in the last some years there's been occurrence in the in the language learning sphere that that basically says okay i got to do input i got to do a crazy 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 amount of input but not only that i'm not even going to speak for the first i don't know two three years and for me like coming from such a humanistic perspective i mean everyone can do what they do but for me from my perspective that's ridiculous because imagine you, you wait two three years to start speaking imagine all of if you would just put yourself out there, start connecting with people. I mean, let's say that if you just study and do input for, I don't know, two, three years, however long you want to say, let's say that your, your accuracy is higher, right? You're going to make less than six, just in theory. Like for me, I wouldn't even care because the amount of time that I could have been communicating and connecting with people in that time where I'm going through some kind of silent period, it just doesn't work. It's just not worth it at all. So for me, I'm just about using the language you know, connecting with people, of course, doing input because because that's how you're really going to advance. But don't shut yourself off from the could be experiences because you know communication, connecting with other people, is what it's all about. Yeah. So the th thing about the silent period is it is so tempting if you are the kind of person who gets intimidated at the idea of speaking to people. Mm -hmm especially if you're an introvert or if you have anxiety yep. and you, you're you terrified that people will be judging you if you speak. It's just so alluring, yep. this idea that, uh, oh, there is a way for me to get to fluency in a language and I don't even have to deal with human beings. Like, it's yep. it's just so tempting, you know? And this is why a lot of people will swear by it. And on top of that, they'll twist certain things. Like, for instance, the research by Stephen Krashen mm. on comprehensible input has a, a lot of stuff going for it. Mm -hmm. I have interviewed Stephen on my podcast, and I've asked him directly, do you think my speak from day one advice conflicts with the comprehensible input theory? And he told me flat out, mm. absolutely not. Mm. Because the whole point is by getting spoken practice, you're kind of engineering conversations to be basic conversations such that you are getting some kind of input from your teacher. It mm. is not a, it's, it's not a black and white situation where if you're not getting pure input, you're only outputting garbage mm. that you're not, you know. <laughs> You're just outputting nonsense and you're never, you're never improving your language skills. Obviously, you can't output without some input. That's the, so, like, I'm not saying do the opposite of mm. the silent period. I'm saying there are moments when I'm silent and I'm studying, but those are mixed in with moments when I'm interacting with somebody. And unfortunately, if you want to be able to speak a language, you have to speak it. In the silent period... Um, I think it has merit as a part of your process. Mm -hmm. There are definitely aspects of how I improve my listening comprehension that don't involve any output. There are like podcasts I'll listen to and there's studying I'll do, I'll replay audio that I'm, I'm not producing anything. But this is not the centerpiece of my language learning approach. It's just something I add to it so I can improve my uh my listening comprehension so yeah the silent period is um 
I've had, I've seen and I've talked to people who are very much behind it. And unfortunately, I think uh, more power to them if they, if they have different goals with their language, mm-hmm. you know, um, if you're passionate about reading the language, if you're, if you're learning an ancient language, then uh, my advice of speak from day one is going to completely conflict with what you want to do with the language. Right. So you should ignore everything I have to say. But most people are learning a language because they want to, in some way, live through that language. And that means they just have to speak. And no native, no native child ever learned to read and write a language before they spoke it. You could, you could say that they had years of, of passive silent exposure, but I would disagree with that. I would say they're babies, they're stupid, they're not able to talk, you know? So when you compare babies and adults, you find that adults under the right circumstances will always learn languages better than children. We have this advantage of already having learned a language. So getting spoken practice is the best way to do that. And you said something that I found to be quite interesting, reflecting on it. And I can see in in people's experience, you said that you will never be ready to speak. And, you know, that's like, oh, damn, you know, because, you know, that that feeling of speaking is just like, like jumping off of a a cliff in in a way. And um, what you just said is quite interesting. The fact that, you know, people can think that they can almost like hack the process if they just you know, they just do input and go through this long, long, long silent period that, you know, things will miraculously be okay, but they still have to be confronted with speaking with other people. And um, the worst thing that I've seen in in the community by those people that follow this kind of strict way is that they build a resistance to speaking to people. They build a resistance. And even some of the top figures in this sector of the community say they still deal with it. And for me, I don't want that at all. No way. You know, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I said, there, there are certain personality traits and, and I understand that. That's like, I, I don't want to take a thump on people who, who have social anxiety mm-hmm. and the idea of speaking to people uh, terrifies them. Um, and like, you know, the idea of me saying just, just speak the language, it's, comes, it's so easy for me to say that. But like at the same time, that does not mean that it's it, that um, that the silent period is a better language learning approach. It's uh, it's an easier way to learn language. And the first thing I tell people is I don't have the easy way to learn language. I don't care mm-hmm. about what the easiest way to learn the language is. I want the most efficient way. I want the the most effective way for me to quickly be able to have conversations. And unfortunately, that way kind of sucks because I'm going to feel like an idiot. And once, once you embrace that, then you're, you're golden, you know? Absolutely. And uh, obviously, one of the best ways we can connect with people instantly is through Skype, through Zoom, through whatever, through I talking the class, whatever class you may take. But um, you mentioned that when you really don't want to even be corrected until you said the intermediate stage. You know, um, I talked about recently, I made a, a video about how the number one thing, in my opinion, when looking for a teacher is, you know, you have a class with them and it's just the ability to feel comfortable making mistakes. And then that teacher lets you make your mistakes and um, they're not like cutting you off. They're not like correcting you. They're not making you feel nervous, you know, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of mistakes in my Russian, but I'm trying to communicate first, right? I'm trying to get my idea across. And uh, once I do that, if they want to give me some corrections, fine, but I don't want to be interrupted. I don't want to be stopped. And um, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't necessarily have to come, the, the corrections, corrections don't need to come at an intermediate stage, but you know, let me talk. <laughs> so what do you think about that? The idea of of, of corrections, like you said, you mentioned you don't want to be corrected till intermediate. For me, that's, eh, I don't need to go quite that far, but I understand the general idea. No, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I say that my focus on 
uh, technical aspects like grammar is mm. something I do a lot more in the intermediate stage. Mm. Corrections, I, I'm, I don't avoid them entirely. I just feel that the uh, I am going to be making so many mistakes. <laughs> it, it's, getting, it's not every, <laughs> getting every single one corrected is is just that that's a big drain on uh, on the conversation. Absolutely, so, and on the know, teacher too. It's like you realize that you can't. She can't or he or can't stop and correct every little thing you do, even if that's what you wanted. That would just be completely draining for the teacher. Yeah, and the interruption, it makes you lose your train of thought and it's a blow to your confidence. One thing that some teachers have done that I do find helpful is they will let me talk, but while I'm talking, uh, we have a separate tab open on a shared Google Doc and they'll just be typing what I'm saying mm. with corrections. And that way I can refer to it later or after I've had my train of thought and I've expressed what I want to express. I can glance at it and I can see, ah, oh, sorry, I used the wrong word or whatever. Um, and, and that way it is a learning opportunity because, like I said, it's not, it's not a, an either or. It's not about just input or just output. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if, I'm, uh, if I didn't get any corrections, that would essentially be a pure output situation. Whereas I, I definitely get corrections from my teachers, but I tell them from the get-go, please only cor only like interrupt me for corrections if it is truly something that is <laughs> hindering the com communication. You know, if I accidentally say my mo my mother is an elephant, then absolutely <laughs> interrupt me and tell me, you know, you made a mistake there. But you know, if I'm if I'm using like you know said instead of estar as mm. an absolute beginner in Spanish. It, she understands, she or he understands what I sure. mean. And that is a lesson for another day when we can focus on distinguishing different verbs to be and whatever it may be. So I, I get corrections, but mm. uh, very few initially, and then more and more with time. Right. Wonderful. One thing that's really helped me, and, um, you know, since I'm a language learner, I I have these thoughts. I think, oh, that's a, that's a good concept of mine. Or, oh, that's a that's an interesting thought of mine. But then I, I, I watch some of your stuff. I'm like, oh shit, that was like one of the things that I thought of. Oh, that was and one of the things that that has really helped me that I that I saw that you were talking about was the idea of relaxing in your target language. And I find that to be such a, an amazing language hack that you know, you know, you can do your input, your study, or you know, your more serious sessions, your your passive, but also just the ability to relax in your using your target language, I find that to be one of the most ultimate language hacks. Yeah, and there's there's various levels. Like the most difficult one would be watching complex content in the language, like uh -huh. you know a Netflix show where they could be speaking very quickly, which may be out of your comfort zone. But there's things that are a lot easier. Like um, you know, one thing that's been exploding lately is Wordle. And Wordle mm. is available in every language under the sun at this stage. So even for my weaker languages, I found it beneficial to, um, if I'm in that language mode, to see what today's Wordle is. And it's just guessing five letter words, which is kind of getting me thinking mm. of, uh, you know, which words can I even remember in that language or which words start with this letter. Um, and another way that uh, a lot of people relax recently is swiping through TikTok. Mm -hmm. So I made completely separate TikTok accounts. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, it, I lost you for a second there. Yeah, the, the audio was getting a little bad out of nowhere when you started to talk about that, uh, what you do to relax. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so as an example, I have made separate social media accounts in each of my active languages. Uh, I think I actually have like 14 Instagram accounts, 14 <laughs> TikTok accounts, and 14 Twitter accounts. Wow. Um, I actually managed to, on Twitter, I managed to nab the word polyglot in a bunch of languages way back in 2009. <laughs> so my, my Spanish... Twitter handle is Poliglota, simple mm -hmm. as that. Um, so I, I dip into these because these are short form content, like a tweet 
is 280 characters. So that's very easy to digest. A TikTok is a very brief video. So it's very easy to me, for me to watch that. And uh, I, whenever I'm on my um, Spanish language accounts, I make sure that I train the algorithm so it knows to only show me content in Spanish. <laughs> and it yep. makes a world of difference that I can now fully relax and enjoy just this content in this language. And uh, you can do that with easier things. And with time, you can expand your range on how many ways you can relax in the language. Absolutely. You know, the, the thing that I, I really do that I've, I've really, really enjoyed is the fact that basically, I, other than YouTube, because that's hard to get around, I've cut out English content, you know, from the things that I watch in terms of, let's say, Netflix, whatever it may be, because the, the quality of the dubs are so freaking high that whatever you little, whatever thing you lose in just like kind of aspect of, of the language in terms of, let's say, English versus if you watch it in Spanish, it's so minuscule that what I get from just receiving the show in Spanish just trumps whatever little details I would mi be missing by not having it in my native language, you know? So I find that- Yeah, I was, I was, very, I was very impressed with, with what a lot of shows have done. Like even when I watched WandaVision a year ago, the every single language dub, they completely translated even one little song that lasted a minute um in the episode and like you could watch that song in both the european spanish version and the mexican spanish version if you wanted <laughs> and it's just so interesting how they do that that like maybe i i remember when i first got into spanish like 20 years ago um it there was a little bit of a, a lack of uh, good quality dubs so it was distracting but I think that's definitely transformed over time. So you can enjoy a host of really cool things that are in, uh, that, you know, come from the English speaking world that are dubbed very well. And then of course, loads of content that's originally in Spanish as well. Absolutely. Now, when you said you really started to focus on Spanish, you declared that you were going to learn Spanish. You told your friends as a way of giving yourself accountability. Now, I'm like that too. I tell my friends, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this as a way to keep me, myself accountable. Um, I think that's very kind of in my personality and maybe in yours as well. Do you think that's like something good to use as general advice that everyone should do or that's just more of a, a personality trait kind of thing? Uh, I do feel it is important for people to, to do this regardless of what their personality is. Mm -hmm. uh, even though there definitely is that sense of anxiety that uh, there's other people. But like ultimately, languages especially are within the realm of um, like human interaction things. So that kind of doing it as a part of a community and even sharing it with your friends changes the concept of it compared to something that you learn by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, like anytime you see any research on, you know, if people want to get in shape or if they want to improve their mental health or if they want to learn a language, that doing it as a part of a group in some form, it doesn't mean you're in a group lesson, but feeling like you have people supporting you and people you can share your struggles and your wins with, um, it's very motivating and, and it, it helps for, helps in a lot of ways. It's like it, your wins are bigger because like we are very self-critical when we feel like we're potentially making progress and we say, oh, you're an idiot. You should be speaking so much better than you currently are. But if you share that with other people, they will build you up and they'll say, wow, you've made so much progress since you, your last video. This is amazing. Mm. And then on top of that, if you are having a down day and you share it with people, you can re relate to others because when we're having a bad day, it can feel like we're the only person in the world who is going through this struggle. I'm the only person who has been studying Spanish for X amount of time who sucks today. Whereas if, if you actually share that story with others and just say, Hey guys, I, I'm feeling really down today. I've tried so hard. To, to get this uh, conjugation in Spanish down and I can't handle it. And somebody will reply and say, do you know what? I went through that too. And it just makes you feel less alone. 
and that can really build you up. So um, it's it's one reason why I feel sharing your story with others, uh, the accountability can can push you in a lot of ways, but even the support can can help you in a lot of other ways. Absolutely. And one of the things I've decided to do this year is to live stream my italki classes. So you can see how you can see a live class of mine in Spanish myself at a an advanced level and you can see like what it what it's like to be at that level, you know, and, and where I'm kind of like stopping or like where I'm kind of, you know, tripping up a bit or but then I'm doing my Russian, which I would say I'm like advanced beginner getting towards maybe B1. And it's just like a completely different different thing. You can see me like, oh, and it's just like the two levels of language learning from from beginner, but being able to use the level the language at a beginner level and at an advanced. I find it quite interesting. I want to show people. It's like going back to what we were talking about about you know doing things in the street. It's like I want them show. I want to show them what realistic language learning is like, even at different stages. So um, you're not going to see perfection, but you're going to see a guy that's fighting through it every single class, and um, that's how I kind of want to inspire people by showing them a really authentic account of what language learning really is. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a great thing to see more people doing this because when I started my blog, one thing I did want to do was showcase the earlier stages of learning a language. Because one thing that frustrated me is that uh, people outside the polyglot community, people, uh, especially in English speaking countries, had this idea that a polyglot is a genius. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, it just comes naturally to them that they'll just like glance at a language book and suddenly be fluent. And I really wanted to showcase this idea that, you know, you will see me struggling mm. and you can see the first video I've ever uploaded in Mandarin <laughs> that it takes me 10 minutes to, to give like a tour of a tiny studio apartment because I'm str that's a lot more important than uploading a video of, Hey everyone, look how impressive I am because I, I speak this language. And it's why these earlier stages is, have been something I've been very pa passionate about sharing with others that they can feel, they can relate to it and they can see, wow, if Benny, who I thought was this genius polyglot, if Benny can hesitate for a whole minute to say this basic word, maybe I can too. And that's kind of opening it up for other people that they see the struggle is real and um, it's good you, you do that. You're doing it live, so there's no edits on it, because uh, that's the the trick with a lot of YouTube videos. It's very easy to cut out all the parts where I sound like an idiot and <laughs> upload the the one percent where I sound like a genius, and then everyone will think I'm a genius. And uh, I I've not been a fan of that kind mm -hmm. of approach myself. Absolutely. I mean, no one's trying to be a guru. It's an honest, honest portrayal, and it's, the channel's called Language Come Up, which in my idea that means just improving at a language, just getting better, right? So that's gonna kind of outline that. So what is the one way that you have kind of learned about language learning throughout your years in terms of how you go about it, your mentality, implementation of something, a realization, a realization about language learning that you made as years went on? Um. I guess like before I started blogging about it, I I was more adamant about my particular approach being the it's my way or the highway. <laughs> and I and I, I've definitely learned through lots of conversation, lots of people rightly so pointing out where that doesn't work, mm. that not everyone has the same goals as me. And a lot of people do learn languages for vastly different reasons. Because I came into this from the perspective of somebody who was traveling the world and moving country every few months and the urgency for me to speak was absolutely there. So people who are like, what, what's this guy trying to learn languages in three months? It's some snake oil salesman. And they just completely di were disconnected from my actual motivations for trying to learn the language because of the real life I was living. And I, I learned to to appreciate that from their perspective maybe they actually are passionate about learning the language i'm not actually passionate about learning and to open up other cultures so i've started to appreciate those perspectives a lot more 
And I'm, I'm trying to, when I talk to people and give advice, I'm trying to remember much more that if, um, like, my situation as someone who is an extrovert, mm -hmm. I realize that a lot of my advice is going to be, uh, it's not, not that it's not ap applicable, but it's going to be a lot harder to implement for somebody who's an introvert. And fortunately, I've had the, the luck of uh, having a, a big team at Fluent in three months and working with other people. And I have people on my team who are absolutely, definitely introverts mm -hmm. and have found lots of merits to a speak from day one approach. So I've learned from them that the ways that I talk about this have to be sensitive to the, the huge variation in the kinds of people who are learning languages. Because oh. ultimately, at the start of my blog, I, in my mind, the only reason people would ever learn a language is because they want to speak with those in another culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ultimately, maybe they're going to travel. And I imagine most people would follow my blog because they are just going to travel to the country. But my blog grew way beyond that kind of scope of just other travelers, the people who have passion for languages in other ways. So uh, it's, been, it's been a learning process for me as well to understand what makes them tick and how can I give advice that is not damaging to them? Because initially I, I did uh, perhaps phrase things that like, you know, you must be brave enough to approach somebody and use the language. And I think that's counterproductive for a lot of people. Uh, even if it's not counterproductive, if you're someone like me who travels to different countries and needs to speak the language right. or they're just going to be alone the entire time. So um, that, that's definitely been a, a learning process for me. And I appreciate more the, the range of possible ways that you can get into learning languages. Wow, that's a great answer. I think it puts a lot of things in perspective over these years, especially about your approach and how you went about things. That was a really nice answer. So speaking about the luck of the luck of the Irish, St. Paddy's Day will be coming up quite soon. I was interested to find out about your history learning Irish. You said that you had studied it 10 years at school. And of course, that didn't go well because that's school. Um, how did you go about studying it and why? Did you have relatives along your lineage? I mean, well, in your immediate family that still spoke it or was it the inspiration just because you are an Irish person, that you're from there? How did that whole situation come about and how did you go about studying it? So what happened was I was in Paris and I was learning my third language. Mm. I started with Spanish, I went on to Italian, and then I uh, was learning French. And I met somebody who asked me, uh, I, th I, th I think they actually said something to me in Irish and I didn't understand them. And uh, they, it was a French person. And they said, well, why don't you speak Irish? You are Irish. Mm. And it made me realize that like I was on the beginning of this journey of, I knew what my life was going to look like at least for the next few years. I did want to continue to learn new languages, but that it was just leaving a big hole in my life that I couldn't speak the language of my own country because I took Irish for 10 years in school and I couldn't even say my name is at mm -hmm. the end of all of that because it, it, it's, it's vastly improved nowadays how it's taught in schools. But when I was growing up, it was extremely academic and wow. very dry and very grammar heavy. So um, it just felt so irrelevant to uh, me as a teenager um, and I just, just had no interest in it. Mm -hmm. But after that, I, I called my mother and I, I asked her like, you know, what ways could I actually get into learning Irish as an adult? And she told me that she goes to this uh, immersion program for adults wow. that's on the West coast of Ireland. So I signed up for it and I went there with her um, <sighs> She, she's a, a primary school, she was a primary school teacher and they, in Ireland, have to speak Irish. They use Irish as a part of their um, uh, teaching style sometimes. Mm -hmm. So um, she speaks fluent Irish. She actually wow. went to a school when she was growing up where certain subjects were taught through Irish. 
Like you would learn geography or mathematics right. through Irish. Um, so she was overjoyed because it was very frustrating for her that I, as a teenager, had no interest in this language that she was passionate about. Wow. So um, I really kicked things off in my mid-20s when I wanted to, um, to dive back into Irish for that reason. And I'm very glad I did because, you know, um, from traveling the world, like initially the first few years, I just wanted to get out of Ireland and see other countries. Whereas eventually I did start to appreciate what makes Ireland special. I did start to look forward to going back to Ireland. And I started to miss a lot of things about Ireland that um, don't don't exist in other countries. Wow. So um, it, it reminded me that like, especially if I'm going to make language learning so central to my life, learning the Irish language uh, is, is kind of a no-brainer because it's just, um, if I want to be the Irish polyglot who doesn't speak Irish, it just, <laughs> just doesn't work, you know? And, and I enjoy the language and I, I try to encourage people who are learning it because it has its own baggage that like, uh, it can feel a little complicated it can feel like there's a lack of resources. Um, it has this like association that it's a dying language, mm. and that that's that's a, a hard thing to push up against. But ultimately, it is the language of the culture that I grew up in, and I really enjoy using it. And wow. there's a lot of ways you can um, you can practice it and. Like I said with my other accounts, I have an Irish language Do you TikTok really? nice. course. Yeah. Legend. <laughs> and I've I've uploaded I've uploaded silly singing videos in Irish <laughs> as well. And I, I enjoy using that language and um it's uh I'm I'm very glad that I was able to get back to that, even though I did exceptionally poor with it uh for ten years mm. academically. You redeemed yourself. That's the important part. <laughs> exactly. Man, I think Irish sounds just so nice. I was watching a video recently on YouTube and it was this guy who's a monolingual Irish speaker. They didn't speak English and this was a video from like 1985 and he's just so happy speaking Irish. It sounds so lovely and I think, wow, the tradition, the culture that must be wrapped up in this man's words for me it's just absolutely fascinating and um, uh, I, I'm very, I'm very happy when I hear people learning languages like uh, Irish, for example, or um, Belarusian, or you know, Richard Simcock learns all these minority languages to the UK. I love that. I think that's just fantastic. But one thing that I learned from you actually is you said that to learn or well, to understand Irish English better, you have to kind of understand the Irish language because there's lots of things that just come directly right into that. I watched your video where you kind of, you kind of like break down the um, Irish English and you're throwing in all these like expressions. I'm like, oh, wow, like I really don't understand that, but it's so cool. And one of the examples you give is, um, I think it's to give out, which in, I guess in Irish that would be to complain and somehow you say give out as an expression to complain in, in English, correct? That's, do I have it right? Yeah, yeah, and if it's funny because if you meet most Irish people are completely unaware that this does not exist outside of Ireland. <laughs> so it, it, is, it is a direct translation of torch amach, which is the Irish for give out. And that's just a phrasal verb, verb in Irish that means to complain. Mm. And even monolingual English speakers have grown up with Hiberno English, Irish English, mm -hmm. and it's just become such a natural way of how we express ourselves that they're completely unaware. And like, so whenever I make a video and I mention that, I get a lot of comments from Irish people saying, I had no idea this was an Irish thing. So there's a, a lot of things like that, lots that we are aware of. But there's also plenty like that that we we don't we don't even know <laughs> that are influ and it's in large part influenced by the Irish language. Like similar to languages like Mandarin, mm -hmm. um, there's no word for yes or no. So it's a very uh, it's very Irish thing that if you ask me a question, you know, is it hot out today? That I reply, ah, oh, it is, it is, <laughs> you know, because I'm repeating the verb of the question. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, that, that's how you do it in Mandarin as well. You, there's a word for not, but there, is not, there isn't a word for no. So 
um, it's it's just interesting that I appreciate even the way I speak English a lot more thanks to having learned uh, the Irish language. And living in a, in America for so long, being surrounded by that, when you do go back to Ireland, how does that make you feel to be reconnected with that that language of of you know your your birth, growing up, your your family? What's that like? Yeah, I feel at this stage that my English is somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Like mm -hmm. my uh, one of my nephews teased me when I was back for Christmas uh, that we were talking about movies. And I, I said, something has a, a score on Rotten Tomatoes. And he's like, no, it's Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> and like, like now I've just been living in the States for long enough that the tomatoes slipped out of me, whereas yeah. that, would, that would never have happened when I first got here. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting because I, I've been, uh, for the last 20 years that I've been traveling, nearly all the English that I've spoken has been in the United States. Mm. I've all, I always go back to Ireland uh, for the likes of Christmas or whatever, um, but it's usually relatively brief visits. So um, it's, uh, it's definitely interesting. But when I do go back, I, I always feel very happy and welcomed and the Irish ways of interaction are very different to, to American ones, there's a sense of teasing people uh, <laughs> that I start to miss, you know? Wow. And uh, I, I do appreciate that whenever I get, can get back to it. Mm, that's lovely. All right, so I'm getting towards the end of the interview, but there's one thing I, I do want to mention, Benny. Um, one, of, one of my heroes in so many is um, Moses, Moses McCormick, Lao Shu. And next month will not only be his birthday, but also the anniversary of when he passed, you know, if you know LeBron James, so LeBron James is a, is a basketball player from Ohio, huge superstar. So we've known about LeBron since, you know, I, I've been in, since I was in high school. For us, we, we accept him as like one of our own. We know that he's a superstar, but for us, he's, he's an Ohioan and we feel that special connection to him. That's kind of how I feel about Moses, you know, he's, he's from Ohio. He's originally from Akron, Ohio. That's a city that I lived in for many years. I studied there at university. You had, you had this day where you went out and you met, you met Moses uh, and then you even made a leveling up video and you had a nice, a really nice interview with him. What are your memories about that? How did that come together? Um, and your, your experience in time with Moses, I'd really love to hear. Yeah, it was, it was amazing because to be honest, when I reached out to him, cause I knew I was passing through Ohio, I, I had a very unimaginative idea of how we were going to spend time together. I thought we would literally have lunch, talk a little bit about, you know, our YouTube channels, and then that would be it. I, I, I had absolutely no, no deeper uh, plans to like do a collaboration or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the second I got in his car, he put, pulled out his camera and he was like, so Benny and I are leveling up. And I was like, we're oh. what? <laughs> <laughs> so I was not expecting that. And, Fortunately, I, I'm the kind of person that I, I, can, I can imagine so many other people would have been like so devastated at the idea of, uh, of having to level up, you know? I know. Because um, it's an intimidating concept. For but sure. fortunately, fortunately I'm, I'm outgoing enough, that even though that's never been my style, that I was like, all right, let's do it. I'm leveling up with the man himself. So um, we went straight to that mall. And uh, one thing that I wanted to do with um, after he said he was going to record this video is I knew that at the time he uploaded completely unedited long cuts. Like his videos were two or three, three hours, hours long. Three hours long. Yep. yep. And what I wanted to do is because uh, editing videos have always been a passion of mine. Uh -huh. More recently, I've gotten into even learning how to edit special effects into videos. Mm -hmm. So like even back then, whenever that was like 2012, maybe um, I wanted to take his very long content and I wanted to turn it into uh, a video of the most uh, like impressive moments. So uh, not only did I want to do that, so I got all his content, I edited it later. I also wanted to make sure there was a, some kind of a narrative in the video. So I made sure in the middle of it, when he turned to me, 
that I I said why what we're doing is so important and that people need to to try to get out of their comfort zones and speak to people so that the that if the video did well that it would get that message across because I did not want this to be about look at how smart these two guys are mm-hmm. you know because that that's always been something I I battle against and uh, so we had those moments and he spoke like I think Hmong and uh, maybe Cambodian and like all these yep. random languages uh, I spoke my Spanish and my French um, and Mandarin too and Mandarin as well yeah that's right and then I uploaded the the video and very shortly after it got on the front page of Reddit. Are you serious? Damn. So obviously that was entirely because of Moses. His story was so fascinating and I will be forever grateful that he is the kind of person that just said, Benny, we're going to level up. Because unfortunately, if it was down to me, if Moses had visited my town, I would have just said, "Let's let's go get a pizza," and that, that would have been it, you know. And that would have it would have been like, "Oh, I got to meet Moses, but uh, you know, I don't really have an interesting story to tell about it." But he made it interesting, and that reminds that that reminds me that I need to do that a lot more. That I need to um, uh, I need to be as as adventurous as he is. That even if I'm an outgoing extrovert, that there's so much I could learn from from people like him. That uh, you know, especially if you share your story in a in a particular way, that he inspired so many so people. Many. So many. And his story was so inspirational. And of course, I was heartbroken when I heard it. And I consider myself so lucky that I got to meet him. Not only meet him but to live this level up experience it's like it's priceless i feel like you you would pay thousands of dollars to uh, to be able to ha- like join moses in a level <laughs> like, up like experience. a boot camp like like a boot yeah. camp like join moses with a, a level up boot camp <laughs> yep exactly so and i i just happened to get that experience uh, out of just luck in me traveling through uh, ohio and um yeah, when when I heard that news, one way I wanted to uh, contribute to his memory was I reached out to, I think, 50 different polyglots, and I got all of us to co- uh, collaborate on a video where we shared some of Moses' most incredible moments from his own reel. Fortunately, someone in his community had access to his best clips, and they could share those with me. And we read a, a poem by Dr. Seuss, and I, I tried to edit it in a very impressive way, and uh, we shared that. And um, I'm, I'm glad I was able to do something to kind of, um, you know, to share that that passion I had for. Even though I only got to meet him that once, it was just such an amazing experience. And it was so natural between you guys. It was it was so natural. And you as a as a self-proclaimed extrovert, it was interesting because you you were explaining, you know, this is a, not exactly my style. I, I do more social circle stuff, you know, parties, gatherings, whatever it may be. So even you were pushing yourself and um, you were running with it. I, I mean, I, I thought, all right, he's out of his element, but you were really running with it. You were living the moment. And I thought that was fantastic. And um, what I thought was also really, really, really nice. And I know these were videos that, I've watched throughout the years, but doing preparation for this interview, I went back and I wanted to watch those again. And in the interview, you did something for me that really, really touched me. And um, I never really, it, I never quite felt it like that before in the previous times I watched the video. At the end of the interview, you take your classic hats and Moses is wearing his classic hat, the one that I don't even know what, how to describe that hat. He always used to wear that well, kind like of hat. a fishing hat, yeah. Uh-huh. And you took it and you exchanged hats, and then Moses was wearing your hat, and um, vice versa. And it was just, I don't know, for, for me that it was, brought such a smile, smile to my face. And um, you know, it's it's been an honor to talk with you, Benny. Um, what I'm trying to get at is, you know. Many people of us have been inspired by people like you, like Moses, 
and you guys were really kind of like the first people to really appear in this online scene of of language learning right and uh, you guys clearly have done so much good and one of my missions is to continue with this trend of goodness of positivity of improving self and in life and um well that's all i wanted to say so thank you yeah keep up the good work uh, keep that positive message going because that's that's what it comes down to is that you know there may be uh, some people like moses and i that early on we're doing this but it's it, we are a language learning community mm -hmm. and each one of us can make a huge difference and inspire so many people so i'm always very glad i never consider it like a competitive thing that you know mm -hmm. if i'm meeting moses then i'm like you know how can i take this guy down because <laughs> he's my competitor no um, it's it, it's been amazing to meet others from the polyglot community and seeing how they spread the positive message so definitely keep up the good work thank you so much all right guys well that was the interview hope you enjoyed it and stay on your come up <laughs>